Hello and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. This is episode 28. I'm Chris Muntz. Can pitches be perfect? This is a fascinating discussion with Donald Brinegar, recently published author of Pitch Perfect, A Theory and Practice of Choral Intonation. It's a great book, by the way. I read it in preparation for this interview, and Donald and I discuss the sometimes mis- misunderstood concepts related to intonation and what makes something in tune or out of tune. Is it possible that we and our education related to this topic might have been lacking in its background? I think it has been lacking for many, including myself until recently when I started studying this, uh, the concept of the mathematics behind intonation, uh, what different types of tuning systems exist, that type of thing, which is why I think this episode is important. The conversation runs mostly along two tracks, uh, partly the common misconceptions surrounding the mathematics of intonation, as well as practical ways to bring concepts of intonation into rehearsals with the singers of all levels. One thing here at the very beginning I do want to apologize for is some technical difficulties in this episode. I had quite a bit of internet connectivity problems at Donald's End uh, in recording this interview, and so what I did was at the very beginning you'll notice quite a bit of uh, catching and uh, almost as if his voice stops and then comes back in really fast, chipmunk style, and then catches up. And that was happening for the first few minutes. And I went back and I tried to edit as much as I could of that so that it sounds like a flowing conversation, but you'll notice. And then about 20 minutes into the interview, we decided to just give up on, sorry YouTube folks, and give up on uh, getting the video and audio to flow back and forth because I knew that that would reduce the bandwidth required to keep the conversation going. So we turned off his video feed. So if you're watching on the YouTube channel, you're going to get Donald for the first several minutes, and then you're going to get a nice pretty photo of Donald for the rest of the episode. On the audio only version, you're probably not going to notice much difference other than that the audio gets a lot cleaner once I get rid of that video feed. So apologies. I just wanted to let you know that I'm not giving up on the good quality audio. I had a little bit of trouble with this one. I think you're going to find it very, very worth it for this fascinating conversation. Before we get there, though, I'm going to give a shout out to a sponsor for this show, an affiliate that I think is just perfectly topical to lead off the show today, and that is Voce Vista. Voce Vista is a sound wave analyzing software that you can use in your classroom to not only improve your own understanding of the topic Donald and I are going to be talking about today, but also, more importantly, improve the sound of your choir, improve their academic knowledge, and improve their understanding of the mathematics and the principles of sound. It's of my opinion that if kids don't understand what they're trying to achieve when they're singing and they're performing, then everything becomes a guess. You're going to hear Donald and I talk about that concept later in this episode. So it's a perfect opportunity as you're listening to us talk today about the the topic of intonation and, and how we measure intonation and how we listen for intonation. Keep in the back of your mind that there is this Voce Vista product that can help you see intonation when you're rehearsing. And it can it's a real-time picture of the rehearsal showing all the sound waves, showing all the overtones, showing singers if they are in tune and out of tune, allowing them to hear what happens when they see the intonation lock in. It's a, an amazingly powerful tool. The technology is just fantastic. And in addition to the rehearsal tools, you can also import audio files from your choir's recent performance into the software and let the students use that as a way of evaluating their performances, which is something that is a really, really cool application of this product. So the way you check it out is you head over to vocevista.com backslash Coralosophy, and then you can download for free the software and play with it for 30 days. If you don't decide that you like it, then you don't have to buy it. But if you do, then I would just encourage you to use the Coralosophy checkout code. You'll get 10% off. I also recently discovered some features of Sight Reading Factory that I didn't even know were there. They might be new. I'm not sure, but I've been using that product for years and years and years. And recently, my students and I discovered the challenge mode features where a student working at home, if, assuming they've got that little individual code that you bought them with your department funds, hopefully with the Coralosophy checkout code that you got used and got 10% off. So they're using that at home and they can set up all these different challenge mode features, which I, they, I think it's cool they call them challenge mode because it makes it seem like a video game. But what's really happening, I've noticed with those features, is that they are scaffolding some help for young singers who are learning to read music 
into the reading process when they're working at home. So they might be able to do it without a teacher, but then they can take those things away. So example would be a little red cursor that goes along the screen while they're reading. Well, that red cursor is training their eyes to move at a steady beat across the page. Well, that's what readers have to do, right? You've got to look ahead in tempo. Well, that red cursor, then you can take it away and see if they can still do well. Then you can also have the, the measures disappear behind you so that you have to look ahead. There's all kinds of cool things there, so check that out and make sure your students have their own membership too. It's just a couple bucks per student. And plus, on top of that, again, you can use that discount code, but it's just so worth it. My students have loved this challenge mode stuff and are really progressing, and it's so much fun to see them learn. So check out sightreadingfactory.com and use promo code Coralosophy at checkout to get 10% off. Okay, I'm on with Donald Brinegar who is a choral director and an academic and an author who recently came out with a book called Pitch Perfect. And I'm excited to talk to him today and let him talk to you about the ins and outs of choral intonation. So welcome, Donald. Well, thank you so much. And what a privilege to be with you and what a great service you're giving to our choral community through this venue. Well, it's sure been a lot of fun and I'm almost a year into it. And it's sure, it's, uh, it is a a service that I think is going to be helpful to people as we go forward. But selfishly, I'll have to admit, it has also been great for me because I get to learn a lot too. Um, I've been, yeah, I've been able to talk to so many smart people in the first year and learning so much. So it's almost like I get my own PD time uh, through that. I'm, unfortunately, my school doesn't give me any credit for this. As, as no, that's right. <laughs> But this is this is real graduate school, <laughs> right? Exactly. It, yeah, exactly. Uh, for my school district, I have to do uh, classes like how to use Google Drive, and I get credit for that, but I don't get credit for this. All right. So the first thing I'd like uh, us to do is I want you to just tell the audience a little bit about who you are, uh, just in case they don't know you, and kind of what led you to the point of uh, wanting to write a book specifically about choral intonation. So give us the the, the life's journey up till this point. <laughs> well, I've been 50 years a choral conductor. Um, first started off in church music as I was going to school because I was actually a trumpet major who sang. And um, when I transferred to USC as a junior, uh, they basically told, choose one. Uh, you can't do both. You can't be a singer and a trumpet player. So I uh, assessed the competition at SC, and there were some amazing trumpet players there. So I became humble and moved towards the voice, only to find out, of course, that when you start to study the voice, it has its own endless uh, issues that you have to deal with. So I was mm -hmm. inexperienced in the voice area to a certain extent, but I was eager to learn. So I kind of saturated myself with all things vocal, all the, the literature that was available to read. And I was kind of dumb lucky that my voice was good enough as a natural talent to study with William Bernard, who didn't take undergraduates, but made an exception with me, which I was very, very grateful for. And, uh, of course, read his book and, and took his classes um, and then had the great opportunity to study with Charles Hurt. And uh, after a year at SC, he became his graduate assistant. And uh, that was a, an amazing experience. So. Uh, he suggested that before I continue with graduate studies that I teach and that I teach for at least four or five years to make meaningful what my education had been up to that point. And so I did. I went back to the high school I graduated from and taught for six years. And at the end of that six years, was invited to be a <clears throat> professor at a cute local community college. And I stayed for 40 years. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, in the meantime, did graduate degrees in voice and music education and conducting and uh, was then later on assistant to Rod Eichenberger and uh, spent three years in chamber singers under his tutelage and finished graduate graduate work. Uh, did all of my uh, doctoral work except the dissertation and uh, um, moved into my career rather vigorously, uh, starting my own choral group outside the college in 1996 and that's a group I still conduct today and I also conduct the Jet Propulsion Lab chorus attached to the Pasadena Symphony as an oh. educational outreach 
So I get to work with the real deal scientists who put things on Mars and they are an amazing group. That's and crazy. as, yeah, it really is interesting. And in fact, we rehearse in the, the laboratory museum. So I look at all the spaceships they put up every day I've been conducting there. That's um, cool. It really is cool. Um, but what I've learned from them and what I've learned from teaching courses at the college that were for non-majors is that very often we have a misconception of how music works as music teachers. We think we understand the inside story, but when we start explaining to those who are not familiar with our terminology or the way we approach things, we kind of upset their sense of how they perceive music to be. And that is what we see in notation isn't really music. It's not music until we realize the notation. And so when you're working with scientists and when you're working with people that are very, very smart, they assume nothing. And they they want the the down and dirty meaning. They want to know exactly what I mean. You can't bluff them, you know. <laughs> and so it really inspired me to say, you know, I think there's this tendency for us to kind of very smoothly blend misconceptions as educators and as conductors and, and put them into a culture or a technique which people enjoy, but we don't necessarily grow from. And by that, I mean, <clears throat> traditions are great, but sometimes we pass on traditions that aren't particularly meaningful um, in, our, in our craft. And music educators tend, in my opinion, to be fairly guilty of it because we tend to learn so much of this by trial and error and without a test of, is that concept really valid? So the book grew out of that notion of, let's define some terms uh, that, that we need to come in common with. And let's make it accessible to people that don't know a thing about music. At the same time, let it be meaningful for those of us who are in the music field and have a community where the amateurs can become acquainted with what it's like to sing as a professional and where professionals are um, emboldened in their craft uh, by having it be truthful and meaningful. In other words, come to agreement on a lot of, of the terminology so that we can move forward. Otherwise, I think we're just inspiring and motivating and interesting, but not necessarily truthful. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's one of the things that I've kind of made an argument about on the show in the last few months has, right. has been related to, you know, the idea that if we, on one hand, as music educators, want to complain that other academic subjects don't take us seriously as academic subjects, but then don't want to base our understanding of our craft in science or in any kind of academic process, um, then I think we might be asking for it a little bit. Um, and, and like you just mentioned, the, the, the concept of do I teach this the way it, because it was the way I was taught or do I teach or do I teach this because of some kind of process that I've gone through to research and or gather, gather information from outside of my tradition? I guess you could say. That is so true. And I, I'd say my library is probably filled four to one with books and uh, articles and uh, the musical field. Um, I don't think of myself as a psychologist, but I certainly have to use those abilities. I had to attain some of those skill sets. Um, and it wasn't comfortable. And I think that's part of the, the problem in our field is that when we have the least bit of insecurity, you love things to be into. And I said, well, of course. And she said, but you don't know what you're doing. And I said, what? <laughs> and she said, well, you, you, you really work hard to get us to sing in tune. And I said, well, yeah, you know, in tune's good. And she said, but you really truly don't know how you're doing it. And it would be good for you to know. Of which then she hands to me the manuscript of W.A. Matthew for his beautiful book, Harmonic Experiences Printed. And I started to pour over it and realize just how little I knew and just how poor I was in that subject area. So at age 43, yeah. do you dive in and reinvent yourself or do you just go along with the traditions of grinding it out? Right. Well, let, yeah, let's talk about that concept a little bit before we move on anyway, which is that um, I think most of us grow up as musicians, well, to, for lack of a better term, tuning everything to our own ear, which, which we should, I mean, we should develop the, that internal audio auditory ability That's right. to over the course of our careers, but we don't often get taught unless we seek it out. Like you met, like in your story, unless we seek out the information of, of why is it that what we hear 
sounds good. And what is it that we are trying to achieve uh, scientifically, mathematically when we do that? So, but of course, what that creates is it creates a little bit of a dichotomy of in uh, it's it's one thing to know those things, but how does knowing those things help us in the rehearsal, on the in the trenches, on the ground with actual singers? Some some of who don't care, uh, they just want it to be fun and sound good. So how do you na- how do you navigate the the need to know the science? and still being an artist. Well, that's very well said. I, I read uh, two days ago on one of the choral sites, a, a person saying, well, I don't really study the music anymore. I don't have time. And besides that, I read music. So I, you know, I'm good to go. And my thought inside is, is well, what a tragedy for your students. Because suddenly you lost, you know that music thoroughly from every angle that you can possibly find you're really teaching misconceptions at the very best. And you're not teaching the truth that's in the music. We teach about truth and beauty, capital T, capital B all the time. You know, a Platonic and Aristotelian concept at, at best. You know, practice is very disturbing to me. And so you you very well said what the issue is. How deeply do you want to dive in so that your clients are benefiting from the expertise you attain? Now, having said that, I don't teach my theory to my choirs per se. I use it. You know, Mm -hmm. and I have practical ways of getting them to tune a chord or to tune a phrase based on what my knowledge of how to get them to do that quickly and efficiently and without adding misinformation in there, which takes them further away from the idea of being in tune. And I should just say at the outset that um, you you said it so well earlier. We like what we know. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. so when we've tuned ourselves to a certain sensibility, let's say equal temperament per se, and anything is outside of that, then we tend to get a little um, uneasy because it doesn't match what we know. But the truth is that we have about about 550 um, tuning systems being used in the world today within about 2,500 scales. Our academies are teaching us at best maybe 11 scales within one tuning system. That makes us very expressively poor. Mm-hmm. And so especially in this day and age of doing quote-unquote world music, where we're committing the ultimate sin of taking our own inherent understanding of rhythm and pitch and laying it on the surface of another culture. It's not where the beauty lies. The beauty lies in unpacking what that culture is trying to say to us about rhythm and pitch and to grow our sense of of understanding of that. Now, is that daunting to learn 550 different tuning systems? I, I can claim that I know five or six pretty well that I can identify by ear really fast. And it's taken me 20 years to learn to do that. So mm-hmm. I don't have any notion that I'm going to learn 550 scales. But my first impression of hearing music that, quote unquote, sounds out of tune is to say, but maybe it is in tune. Let me give you an example. Mariachi music. Mm. To, our, to our North American, Norte Americano ears, that music sounds somewhat out of tune. But it's not because it's out of tune as is they appreciate a deeper level of prime number ratios in their music. They use the septimal seven. We don't. In our culture of choral music in the United States, we use the third partial and the fifth partial. And after that, we eliminate the others as sounding discordant. So when they use the septimal seven, and sometimes even the 11th partial, those are screaming like out of tune with the equal temperament. And mm-hmm. they kind of bark at you a little bit unless you understand how to contextualize that. So we do have Western traditions like Harry Parch. We can go and examine that music and listen to that. But musical expression is rich. And I'm okay with someone inco- incorporating a particular culture or a particular way of doing it and saying, this is our way of doing it. But, but don't discount the others, number one. And two, do you really know what you're doing? <laughs> do you really know how you're achieving that? And can you do mm-hmm. that efficiently? So what are some examples then of, in your choir, how you would use the math, use the science without actually talking to them about it? Well, for instance, if we're singing, uh, we, we've we premiered a fair number of pieces, uh, Lawrence and the Chief among them. If he's stacking a chord with a nine in it, for instance, my undergraduate schooling would have said let's say it's a c major nine which would be what c in an alphabetical order c d e g right so i was taught then you get the c and g in tune 
add the E in, you know, get it, get it high enough, get it sweet enough, and then add the D as the dissonance. But in fact, in the way it works with the overtone series is you tune up the two perfect fifths, C, G, and then D, and put the E in in any particular slot you want, whether it be another perfect fifth, two more fifths up, right? C, G, D, A, E, or you put it as E a fifth partial, or you put it as E as the piano. And, and the theory I'm teaching allows you to do any one of those three depending on preference and depending on how the piece is organized. For instance, if the piano is reinforcing that E, then you better learn the E that is the, the piano's version, 14 cents sharper than a singer would want to sing in terms of natural tuning. But barber shoppers and jazzers will use the, the E that's based on perfect fifths. I'm going to jump in and interrupt for just a second to make sure that if you are still programming some of your concert season, if you are, here it is in January when this episode comes out, but you could be listening to this episode anytime. Uh, if you're programming for an upcoming concert season, make sure you are throwing into the mix of your resources for sheet music. A couple websites that are awesome enough to come on board on this show and support what we're doing here. So support them by checking them out. And one of those is RyanMain.com. Ryan Main is an independent, self-published composer, clinician, awesome educator, and he is a specialist. I've seen him work with kids from junior high to high school and just does an amazing job with them. And it's no wonder that the music he writes just makes those kids' eyes come alive. So if you don't have any Ryan Main music in your library, head to ryanmain.com, check out his site for his work, and you can enter Coralosophy at checkout to get 10% off for Ryan's stuff. You can also go over to graphitepublishing.com. Graphite is a online music publisher that publishes music by Eric Barnum, Jocelyn Hagen, Tim Takash, Joshua Shank, many more. And there's a wide variety of styles and difficulty levels, instrumentation, uh, art songs, vocal music on there that you can check out as well. They're awesome people over there and they're experts and they're really pushing the envelope into the 21st century of the online music publishing. And just like always, you can use that Coralosophy checkout code get 10% off at Graphite Publishing as well. Also, don't forget to stay in touch with the Coralosophy podcast. There are several ways to do that. You can email me at coralosophy at gmail.com if you want it to be just a private comment about something that you hear on the show uh, and or to submit a question that I might consider for a future episode of Topics. We'd really like to hear from you uh, in your feedback in that way. Another way to give feedback is to join the Coralosophers Facebook page, and that is a listeners-only page that you, we can have context-rich discussions about show topics there, so feel free to join that page. And then for the real insiders, there is a Patreon page. That's patreon.com backslash Coralosophy. And for the cost of a cup of coffee a month, as little as $3 a month, you're going to get access over there to some supplemental materials that I create once a month, a patron-only episode that gives lots of behind-the-scenes uh, updates and my thoughts and feelings about making the show, as well as some special patron-only discussions that we have there. That's a really cool and growing group. We're up over 20 members over there, so the conversation is getting richer and richer. Another cool thing I'm doing on the Patreon now is I am giving, I'm leaking show guests before they come on and allowing guests to ask a question. In fact, later in this episode, you're going to hear the very first ever Patreon question for a guest. So I'm excited about that. So head over to patreon.com backslash Coralosophy. Now back to the chat. Rather than explain the theory, theory per se to my singers, I just have rehearsal techniques which contextualize how I want the pitches to sound. And this is done primarily through timbre, um, vowel agreement, but also by discrete pitch selection. All the books that have been written about tuning in the choral world miss one concept, and they miss that one concept which is most necessary. Our perception of intonation is not about agreement of pitch. It's more about agreement of vowel and timbre. Uh -huh. And you've experienced this feeling that, you know, we're singing together and then the piano plays and we're almost a half step away. How did that happen? We all went there together. We all smoothly just went to the flat side instead of staying in, in tune with each other. And so the book addresses that very directly. Timbre is related to tuning, 
and is probably the more important concept than actually the correct pitch in terms of how most people practice. But in fact, choosing the correct pitch, of which I would claim that we can sing 56 in the octave rather than just 13, um, and that I can teach you to sing those 56 discreetly and in in context uh, through practice and through application, um, then our tuning becomes not only uh, more timbrely uh, in agreement, but our vowels start to agree. And because I work with amateurs uh, most of the time, this has been stunning to see what they can sound like, even though they know little to nothing about music. So I don't have to explain all the concepts behind it, although I have offered seminars often. And when I taught college, every Friday was an opportunity for a seminar and the topics were open to what the students want to talk about. Just didn't have time in rehearsal. Mm-hmm. So I've, I found time outside of class. Yeah. That, now it's, it's, it is one of the most fascinating things to uh, experience in a choir rehearsal or a choir performance. Sometimes you, I, honestly, I, I actually experience it more in the live performance in front of an audience where a choir will right. just, sink sink to uh, sink immediately almost within the very beginning of a piece uh right. to a half a half step below the pitch but then never change after that that's right uh, and that's that what how would you would you attribute that mostly to timbre choices well we get there because we made these choices in timbre um in other words um we we like agreement and we like sounds that that blend and that have agreeability. But if we don't agree on what we're referencing that timbre to, that's when we begin the smooth glide down. Remember that singing any of the overtones of the, let's say the key of C, the structural over, overtones are G and D. Um, the color overtones are A, E, and B. And the color overtones are flat to the piano significantly. But what choirs choirs do is that when they have a series of major chords, they will be flat to the piano in their tuning. And instead of adjusting the third of the chord and, and, and creating a color out of it, they adjust the root and the root starts to sink. And within three chords, you can be a half step away pretty quickly because the third is uh, 14 cents. The sixth is even 16 cents flat to the piano. So, And they sound very resonant. They sound very agreeable. And so choirs tend to like those sounds because they match the vocal track. But what happens is we lose sight of the root of the chord. And in the book, what I do is outline when you're singing this chord in this key context, this is what you all need to agree you're referencing to. And... Uh, and that reference within a mode carries a color with it. For instance, Lydian has to be sung with a brighter tone. Phrygian has to be sung with a darker tone to get these kind of agreements. So wow. that's part of what the book is all about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is, yeah. It's parsing that out. Right. And I, and when I was reading it, I, um, you know, this, the, the concept of, of tuning systems and especially in, I think for choral musicians, I'm not sure if you'd agree with this, but the, the, kind of having to constantly jump back and forth from equal tempered tuning and and a, some type of just intonation is probably our, at least in the Western canon, uh, is our two big places where we live because we might sing something a cappella uh, and want to hear that overtone rich tuning system that that, that can happen when it's just justly tuned. And then, but then on the next piece on the concert, there's a piano piece. Right. Um, and you and you'd probably want to sing in tune with the piano, um, and and so that that jumping back and forth is the challenge. Is that something that you find that once choirs are kind of trained to listen for these types of things, that they just do naturally? Well, you've you stated this very well, and I've listened to some of your former broadcasts where you've discussed this, and and you're really right on the mark here. The issue is not that we have to jump between tuning systems. It's that we have been enculturated to believe in one tuning system and attune ourselves to it, and that's equal temperament. If we would, however, start with just intonation and the several systems of just intonation, third partials and fifth partials, and learn to appreciate that in our singing, then the leap to equal temperament is very easy because those are adjustments we have to make. 
So, for instance, when I'm vocalizing a student, I don't use third, six, or sevens because the third, six, or sevens with the piano tend to drive the extension. There's help. We don't have to do that with just intonation. So, singing to drones, learning to sing true, pure, perfect fifths and pure thirds only broadens the meaningfulness of equal temperament because the the incredible beauty of equal temperament is it's all the tuning systems in one. You just have mm. to have the imagination to hear it and know it. So there's so, no there's no there's no difference between being able to sing either side as long as you take ambiguity out of the question. So maybe a way to think of it too could be again for the 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 director who's never kind of di- uh, scratch or has only scratched the surface of this topic. If you are singing and doing mostly a cappella or singing with drones of uh, when you're vocalizing students, then you are teaching them essentially to make the adjustments that is required for just intonation. Right, uh, it's, na- it's natural. It's natural to the process so that then when the leap to, or maybe it doesn't have to be a leap to, but the transition to equal temperament would happen more naturally that direction because the singer's already used to listening and making an adjustment. Yeah. One of the exercises I do with my choirs is to have them to improvise pure fifths and and seconds, because second is actually another perfect fifth up. Uh, then invite in the subdominant, which is an, is an um, undertone. I, I can explain that later if you wish, but basically we, we operate with the overtones. Um, and then... No, go ahead and go ahead and define undertone. For well, us. undertone means that no matter how far you got in the multiples or addition of uh, frequencies, you don't reach an undertonal pitch. In other words, if you're in the key of C, there is no F in the overtones, no matter how many partials you go up. And as human beings, we tend to be able to hear and discreetly understand up to the sixteenth partial. If we want to understand partials greater than that, then we have to octave reduce them. And the system that I approach this with does that for you. Um, But having said that, if I get my group naturally singing these things with a really resonant tone over a drone, and then I play the piano uh, chord that they're replicating, let's say CEG, it sounds wildly out of tune to them automatically. Yep. But... What they can appreciate in that is that it also is wildly out of tune equally. That is, the C chord, the D chord, the E chord, all major chords, let's say, are all equally out of tune and in the same way, and they create the same beating patterns. So I can get the choir to imitate the beating pattern of the equal temperament, which, by the way, usually most tuners tune it to about six beats per second in the out of tuness. You can actually count them one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, guess what matches that almost very smoothly? The human vibrato. Uh So you can match with vibrato the beats of the piano and you'll sound perfectly in tune. Um, Which which would explain why vibrato was creeping in during the romantic period into singers' performance practice as more music like Brahms was starting to be piano accompanied. Well, I'd I'd even take it back a little bit further. I'd take it to Rossini and Rossini's comment about the newfangled technique and singers through Garcia Uh, and the the teachers of the bel canto technique who decried this kind of, he called it bawling, B-A-W-L-I-N-G. He didn't like to hear singers go above the staff and, and sing with such a loud and proud sound. But Garcia discovered that by slightly lowering the larynx and putting the singer's foreman at the forefront of the singer's uh, sound ideal, they could fill big rooms very easily with a lot of noise. Yeah. Um, I encourage my singers to use the singer's format. I find that, for instance, blend, I find is what we add to sound, not what we take out. And so I try to be clear. (laughs) I try to be clear with my singers about this is what the music's asking you for. Put that into your voice and the vibrato has a tendency to take care of itself you know it just it will sound wrong and um i don't ever ask my singers to sing with a straight tone but i ask them to sing in tune and that speeds up the vibrato and at least lessens its waveform Mm -hmm. yeah i i think um that's an important concept that it's amazing how much pushback uh it can get depending on how who you're talking to about that topic but you know that if if Sometimes I, I don't like to address vibrato either. Uh, I, I'll address it in a similar way, which is I'll just tell the singer, I just want them to sing one note. 
There you go. And, and, uh, and, and however you, you have to figure out how to do that. <laughs> that's, that's your job. Um, right. depending on, yeah, but with, uh, what's interesting too, is that depending, it's like you said earlier, it's people like what they know. And right. if, and if they're used to the singing experience being about what they sound like individually, let's say your background is mostly as a soloist. Right. And I find that that's harder for people to make those types of adjustments to get the information based on what they hear uh, instead of what it feels like and, and all of that. But that that might be a totally different conversation. Well, that's so, very, that's very well said. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I have I do have a, a question for, to to pose to your expertise at the risk of throwing some of my adult friends under the bus. Oh, okay. I've noticed I've noticed that in my career uh, of lip, wearing two hats. Uh, one as a high school choir teacher every day, mm-hmm. and then one working with an adult professional ensemble. Right. I have found that pretty consistently through the years, and I've been doing both of the. I've been doing uh, both of those things at the same time now for eleven years. Uh huh. And and I've discovered that my students, my high school age students, have an easier time starting in one key. And never leaving that key, right? Than than the adult professional trained master's degree students do. I totally agree. With you. Any theories? Yeah, I think inexperience is helpful here. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think our brain. I think our brain gets clouded as professionals with lots of other issues, and that I find that when I direct professionals, part of what I have to do is rein in their thinking and focus their thinking into a narrow band or narrow field of ideas. So um, because there's an ability with a professional to sing with uh, many more sophisticated sounds, many more possibles, um, they're not always reading the notation from the same point of view as you are audiating it. The younger students are waiting for you to tell them how to audiate it and how to experience it. So there's less gap. Between, uh, what, between what you understand, what you know, and what they're able to execute. With professionals, they're constantly adding in other experiential elements. And we forget, as professionals, just to be inspired by the music and not by our, the way we make the music. I think that often factors in that we get a little too proud of how we vocalize ourselves rather than let the music continue to teach us how to vocalize. That yeah, that's an I've never I've never thought of it that way, but but it makes sense now when you say it. Of course, it comes cascading into my brain as the obvious answer would have been. So I appreciate that. So uh, so what you're saying sounds like is that a professional musician, let's say there's an ensemble like mine that's 16 voices. Uh huh. They're they're going to come to me with 16 different ways of having learned to sing their whole life. That's it. And 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 all 16 of them are going to be hearing the music in their head in a different way. That's it. And getting it to lock in together is so much harder than when I've got my 16-year-olds who are a blank slate. That's it. And and I've I've only given them one option of how to sing. <laughs> and well, and think of particularly with your men who post puberty have the biggest change and the biggest recognition of a new instrument that you are contextualizing for them. Mm-hmm. In fact, you're starting them on their professional path. And the whole point of my book is that technique that we're trying to develop in them emanates from the music, not from our sense of what technique is. Um, Charles Hurt was adamant about that in his teaching. We draw our techniques from the music. You know, as a trumpet player, I had technique books, right? And although mm-hmm. there are a few vocal technique books in general, we tend to learn to sing by just singing. <laughs> and, and we don't have vowels to push and, and keys to remember. So there's kind of a, a certain haphazard, ambiguous way we go about it. I think pros, when they come to know their voice, kind of hold on to that preciously because that's hard work. It's really hard work to establish a good sound and you know, find your awe vowel and all the things we do as soloists. And I've, and I've lived my life half as a, as a featured soloist with rather prominent conductors and in the studio teaching high-end uh, singers as well as rank amateurs and the choral world. And I felt there should be no gulf between the two. I felt that being a good ensemble singer and being a good vocal technician and being a good soloist were one and the same 
pedagogy. And so I established a master's program 20 years ago to develop that notion entirely. But there's mm-hmm. no golf speech because I was told constantly by the voice people, what do you want to do with this choral music? And the choral people say, don't, you know, don't listen to so much of the solo people and the conducting people. Why aren't you just working on your conducting? Blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, <laughs> instead of unifying, right. unifying the, uh, academic approach everybody got into their several fiefdoms and, and barked at each other and uh, you know that's not the happy part of what we do yeah no it's that's true and um, you're living okay. it out every day yeah no exactly and and one of the things that's interesting i found it is kind of going back to the the question i asked you a second ago is that one of the things i've done over the years in uh in the pro group is i've just developed kind of really not on purpose but it's been relatively frequent out of my 16 singers where five to six of them are end up being uh, now that we've been doing it a while, my former students who have, who have graduated, gone on and gotten degrees and in music and come back to town or whatever. And I'll hire them uh, because I know that at least when I start speaking about what I want, they're going to know. That's like great. they're they're gonna have that concept in their head, and I've just never really thought of it in those terms. So that's that's really that's really interesting. Um, okay, I'm gonna change the direction just a little bit here okay. and uh, take it kind of back into your book a little right. bit because I, right. I did read it. I read it the uh, over the the Christmas break to try to prepare for this, and I loved it par- partly because I'm already a nerd about this kind of stuff, right? <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I also uh, found that I went through it and learned a ton of stuff and, and uh, that I didn't already know. And one of those, one of those, for example, was that I didn't realize there were different kinds of just intonation. I always thought of just intonation as its own special thing. Uh, so t- talk to me a little bit about what th- the three limit and five limit are. Okay, good. Um, all just intonations are based on, um, what are called rational tunings and rational tunings are of nature. That is, they, they get their meaning from the vibrations being of nature. The Western canon all the way from chant up to the present day essentially uses only three of the low prime numbers and that's two, three, and five and their multiples and their derivatives. So for instance, where there is very clearly a B flat in the overtonal system as the seventh partial, our pianos are calibrated so that where the hammer hits the string actually dampens or denies that seventh partial because it creates a clang in the piano which doesn't match the the beauty of the piano when it's not present. I'm not sure I'm saying that very well, but essentially you're eliminating the seventh partial by by plucking the or dampening the string at that point. Yeah, the, the septimal seventh uh, is, this is something that gets so misunderstood, that even among theorists, they'll say, well, you can't really use just intonation because the B flat's so flat, 31 cents flat, that you know, can't play with the piano. Well, we don't use the B flat that is the seventh degree of the overtone series. We use a B flat that is constructed of two perfect fifths below C, you know, perfect fifth down is F, then perfect fifth down is B flat. That particular B flat is only four sense different than the piano and there's another b flat which creates a perfect a major third of d and that particular b flat is related to the ninth partial that is it's the major third underneath d my point here is that there's two b flats we can choose and there's a third the septimal and we don't use the septimal because we find it out of tune to our ears to our westernized ears so what i do in the book is be very discreet about making sure that when we talk about third partial overtones those are all perfect fifths so i can start a string of perfect fifths starting let's say with d flat so we go up perfect fifths d flat a flat e flat b flat f c g d a e b f sharp c sharp by the time we get to c sharp we've gone up seven octaves over 12 fifths and that c sharp is sharper than the d flat we started with by 24 cents that's called the pythagorean comma or mm-hmm. we would say, I'm singing in Pythagorean just intonation. Everything related by perfect fifths. And as you saw in the book, I spend several chapters discussing that because everything we sing prior to 1600 in the choral world has a big foundation in that world. Um, starting with the notion of Guido's hand and how that unfolds the notion of everything in relationship by perfect fifths. Mm-hmm. 
we now advance into other parts of the of the medieval Renaissance period and find that people are experimenting with other um, just intonations, and that is the the one based on the fifth partial. So here's the problem with the nomenclature. Third partials are perfect fifths and fifth partials are major thirds. And that's hard to get in our brain <laughs> that the third is the fifth and the fifth is the third. But the notion right. here is, yeah, go ahead. And would you say that, uh, so is it just for the people who are new to this terminology that are coming into the episode? Yeah. It, would you say that the partial, let's say the fifth partial, is a, is synonymous with the fifth fifth overtone of the fundamental? No. No. Uh, okay. So how how would you well, dif- there's, differentiate there's, that? Well, the language is this: we have harmonics, right, and we have partials. Every part of the overtone system is a partial, including the fundamental. But if you say you have the fundamental, then you go to the octave, right? Then you go mm-hmm. to the third partial, but the second overtone is what I'm calling the third partial. I, I lay see. that out. Okay. I lay that in the book because people mix and match those metaphors and they really are not the same. So when I say harmonic, there's a different number system. When I say partial, there's another numbering system. So I tend to like to use partials because the the numbers start with one and just go up mathematically by addition. Said another gotcha. way. Got it? So yep. if if I have a fundamental of 33 hertz and i double it to 66 i've got an octave if i add another 33 cents to that's 99 now i've got what i hear in my ear is a perfect fifth um and so it's additive and multiplicative that is three times one gets the same result as one plus one plus one so Mm -hmm. that's where people get all bogged down in this and people get bogged down in the ratios and all that i certainly did for a couple of years it just drove me nuts but now i do it so fluidly that you can give me any pitch in any key and i can tell you how many cents it's different from the piano and oh by the way are you talking about are you talking about third partial or fifth partial because i've just spent so many hours manipulating those numbers over and over and over again but mm-hmm. i've also practiced in my choir so that i have found and i'm going to really send you into the the medical metaphysical world here, even in my conducting, I teach conductors how to conduct these partials in tune and out of tune that be within our own physical gestures, our own audiation and our own arm and hand gestures. We can manipulate the tuning. In other words, you can conduct out of tune and you can conduct in tune. And I know the difference when I watch a conductor that they are either operating from a tuning system that they're audiating or they're just making it up. <laughs> so how, can you give us an example? <laughs> sure. If I move my hand in certain positions, I will get a slightly sharper affect. If I turn my hand more parallel to the earth, I'll tend to get a slightly flatter affect. Um, I don't tend to teach that per se as a point of view that you have to look like me, but every singer, everybody who conducts needs to find that within themselves. And um, that we know that the hand represents shaping of the vocal track. We know that the wrist has a tendency to influence laryngeal height and depth. We know that the way that you breathe and the way you hold your posture has an effect on on the students. But the chief factor of studied and researched of what influences a choir into their sound is your voice. Your choirs benefit from the fact that you have not only a beautiful speaking voice, but you have a beautiful singing voice. And I think you can tell the difference in choirs when that's true. Oh, I definitely agree with that. I, I wonder if the in the conducting at the hand gesture level, mm-hmm. that there, there, I my only concern with that as using that as the one thing that affects it, I can't imagine that the teaching that happens all the time when this that doesn't also affect the intonation of the choir. No, I don't think that's the one thing that affects it. I think it's a part of it, and I think it's all oh, okay. of our study. I don't, I right, don't think there's right. one factor more than any other. But at the end of the day, if you're not audiating those pitches in a con- context, then at best what you're getting is ambiguity. Yeah, definitely. I definitely agree with that. I, I think that if the conductor doesn't have uh, a, a pretty detailed CD of the piece playing in their head. That's right. Um, then it's really, really hard to get a good sound out of a choir um, because right. your your reaction time to them drifting away from the intonation that you're wanting that's right. uh, will, will, will be too slow. That's to right. Get, to get them to change anything in the moment, and and I think that the one of the the question I asked earlier about high school kids versus adults might 
I, I had thought a little bit about that context as well, because in my high school choir, I'm, I'm in front of them gesturing and reacting constantly. That's right. Uh, because they are re- 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 uh, relying on me to make whatever little eyebrow motion or little finger motion or whatever right. it is that suggests maybe they've gone a little bit out of tune. And whereas with the adults, I tend to not be as micromanaging. That's um, right. That's right. In fact, you you treat them more like a chamber choir of self conductors because uh-huh. they've earned they've earned that respect. Right. Um, and with the younger ones, you're more trying to evoke the sound from them and help them with that. Mm-hmm. I just only ask that when teachers do that, and I and I train conductors um, um, in a master's program every summer that they be only looking like the music, not the compensation away from what the music was not. And that is, you're not trying to adjust pitch by pointing your finger in the sky. You're not overlifting your eyebrows because any exaggeration we create gets repeated. So just look like the music. And if it doesn't, Mm -hmm. put your hands down and get them to do that with you and or get them to realize what they're not doing that they need to be doing. In other words, to me, art is about intention, not defense. And uh, so once the conductor goes down the sucky road of evaluating while they're going along and reacting to it, then what comes in the next musical moment can't unfold because you didn't show it. Yeah, no, I I absolutely agree with that. I think that's a very important concept that uh, could probably be taught more in undergraduate programs. Um, gra- well, graduate programs, it, all, of course, but it, at the even at the undergraduate level, I think a lot of importance gets placed on uh, you know the whole conducting along with a recording thing. That's um, right. Which where is abhorrent to me. Yeah, I agree. And it, it doesn't it it sets up the concept that right away from the beginning of a conductor's training that that what they're hearing doesn't need to be reacted to because when you conduct to a right. CD, nothing you do is going to change anything that they're That's doing. That's exactly it. And if you don't embrace the fact that what you are doing is what you are getting, then um you've missed a big opportunity because your choir is an incredible lab for you to to better your conducting mm-hmm. and uh, yeah now right? but yeah yeah I, th- I think that's important um in your book you have uh-huh. a, a a pretty great kind of glossary of terms yeah um if you had to and we've already hit a couple of them so if, uh-huh. if there were a couple if a couple that you could think of that just if you had if it were up to you every choir teacher of any level director of any level would know and understand these couple terms uh, what what would you pull out as the most important? Yeah, I thought about that when you asked the question earlier. Um, I put the glossary at the front of the book, as you noticed, because I wanted to have some agreement on the terms, but at, at least in the way that I see them, so that when things were discussed within the book, you could go back and say, oh, that's what Don means by that. Because it's possible to have you know multiple meanings for, for things, as in just intonation. It is commonly held that just intonation means of nature. People just don't realize it could be based on three and five and seven, 11 and 13, that in the Western music, we do three and five. But one of the concepts I like to teach very early on, and the glossary, by the way, I tried to keep pithy. That is, I didn't try to go into long, uh, divergent explanations, but rather how few words could I use to teach the concept? And one of those is meter. And I'll ask my graduate students, what is meter? And how many words can you say? It? <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, my definition is meter is the arrangement of accents. Now, is there more to it than that? Well, of course. But you have to start with the fact that if you don't have accentuation, you don't have meter. And so I'll give them a, a tapping noise. I'll just go, you know, tap, 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 tap. And then ask what meter in. And everybody says, well, there's no meter. I said, right. Now I'll go tap, 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 tap. Tap the yellow, well, you're in some kind of three, right? What note gets that value? Anyone you choose, right? So very early on in our education, we teach children that 4-4 four, four is the common time and that the quarter note gets the beat. And all the, the amazing meanings that can come out of music now get lost because we've put the concept um, uh, in their heads incorrectly. Although 4-4 four, four is common time, in the Alleluia Chorus of Handel, he does not beat all four beats equally. He only beats one and three equally, or somewhat equally. 
and two and four are absolutely diminished. So, for example, if you've learned that four four is our meter and there are four beats per measure and the coordinate gets a beat, Alleluia, of course, becomes Alleluia, Alleluia. But any decent conductor is going to want them to go what? Alleluia. Oh, well, you can't do that if all four beats are quarter notes are, and are equal in weight. Well, oh, okay, so I've got a question here for you next from Shannon, one of my Patreon members who, who would, uh, chimed in and wanted to, to get a question in for you. And she's a high school Wonderful. teacher. Um, and, and, and she wants to know if you were to pick something out of your book that she could take into her high school classroom tomorrow without a whole lot of, you know, maybe studying a whole graduate level course on this intonation stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, are there suggestions in there that you can think of from your book that could help help somebody in a classroom of young singers tomorrow? Sure. Have them sing a C or have them sing a, a, a particularly comfortable low note. And let's call that Do. <clears throat> so we go Do and have them show that with a Kerwin symbol, right? Fist kind of mid mid body section. Mm -hmm. And then with the other hand, open the hand up with the thumb down and show soul. So I'm go do so with the other hand, then go back to do do, and then go back to so. And then I ask the students, while you're singing do, I'm going to ask you to lift your other hand to soul. Think soul while you're singing do. Mm -hmm. I call this putting soul in your do. Because I'm pumped, right? Um, okay. So, <laughs> so yeah. as we're as we're holding do. Do, and I start to think of soul, you'll hear the change in the color of my voice. So here's Do without the thinking, and then I'll add it. Do, and immediately you hear a different color and a different affect. I can also do the same thing with me so that I can get three different colors out of my voice. Do, all based on the overtone system. Mm -hmm. And that's how I create that timbre connection. So do they, uh, do you then e evolve that into like maybe sections of the choir singing the so while the do continues in the choir or do you just absolutely, mess with that? Absolutely. And I have exercises in the book for that exactly. Okay. And, and uh, just, you know, sensitizing the fact that when we sing a tone, we never sing it alone. We're always singing in the context of other pitches. It's our agreement about which pitch we're all referencing to that starts us on this really cool journey. Mm -hmm. If we all agree that we're monitoring Do while we go to our Fa chord, that color of that chord will change because Fa does create Do, but Do does not create Fa. Mm. So it's a very interesting way to kind of get your mentally wrapped around it. And I often start this whole process with air keys. I think you saw the air keys in the, um, in the book, which is a way to teach major scales within a couple of minutes of, mm -hmm. uh, of having them draw the letters in the air and they find out that the, the, uh, the for instance, if you draw a D in the air, it takes two strokes to draw it, right? And the key of D major has two sharps. If you draw a capital A, one, two, three, A has three sharps. Draw an E, four strokes to the pen, four, and so on. I detail that in the book. But all of a sudden, the kids have learned the circle of fifths in a couple of minutes, which we usually take a couple of weeks to learn it. Mm -hmm. um, so things like so that. even though yeah so even though the book has a lot of very advanced technical information in it it's not something that uh that a choir director that has uh young singers would uh wouldn't be able to access and get something out of right away which is what i appreciated about it uh was that you could you you can understand as the, the educated professional in the room your need to kind of wrap your mind at, around this material right. But your your singers don't necessarily have to know the math in order to actually do it. That's correct. I think the math is helpful if you're going to teach it. But even then, I don't think you need to know the math all that much. Um, mm -hmm. It helps me to teach teachers about it because I do know the math. And it allows me to eliminate ambiguous statements I can make about it that are, are not helpful. So I did write the book for three Three people. One, the person that's practicing making music and just wants to know more about how music and its nature works, especially as a singer. Two, those of you who are going to teach it, and those of you who are going to teach the teachers. The, those were the three levels I was aiming for at the book. Um, and I was also just trying to share, here's how I look at a score, and here's how I get into it, and here's how I 
create rehearsals that are very efficient because I know exactly what pitch I want everybody to reference to. Yeah, and I I, th I think that's wonderful because I, I this is a topic and a subject. Obviously, I invited you here to talk about it because I think that it's a subject that we are as a as a profession undereducated on. Um, right. Right. And, and I think it's important that more singers and directors know about it. Uh, for example, one, one, uh, one, you'll probably appreciate this so experience that I had in my career that was probably the most frustrating tuning experience of my whole life uh -huh. uh, was was the the CD that Contra I made are, uh, of Matthew Harris's music. I'm not sure if uh -huh. you've ever done any of Matthew's music. It's I know wonderful his music. It's yeah. beautiful music. Yeah. It's it's great music. But he does he com uh, he is a pianist first, right? And he, he clearly has the music conceptualized as in, in well-tempered tuning, but then frequently it, it's performed a cappella. Right. Um, which there is uh, there a lot of the things that he would write, and we did a whole album of his music. Uh, and uh, in digging in, if like you had done maybe one or two pieces of his music, you might not notice it. But if you start to do an entire, you know, 80, 70 minute album of, yeah. of his music, you start to realize, oh my goodness, this is happening all the time this music is composed at the piano uh, right. and th and then trying to get a professional ensemble to sing it sing, especially through the key changes uh in in tune would require uh and, and and so i don't i'm not throwing matthew into the bus the music is awesome and it's worth the effort uh to get it to work in, in yeah. human voices but when i say uh when i say that it was a frustrating experience it was more about in communicating that to the singers Mostly Sorry. adults, mostly adult singers who, in fact, I had one mostly uh, opera background tenor uh -huh. get really get quite frustrated in 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 the recording session uh, when I told them, okay, so we just to give you a, a scenario, we were singing through something in the key of C, right, and, and then there is a key change into the key of E, right, and uh, and the tenors had E from the previous key. Uh, carrying over into the key of E right. and we just, we were not able to get it to tune at first. And until I was starting to tell the tenors, you're, you're, the E in that next key cannot be the same pitch. Like it's going right. to have to change. It's going to have to change. And I, and I had a tenor uh, get quite frustrated with me and just flat out told me there are not two E's there. E, an E is an E. So why are we, <laughs> why are we having this conversation? And, and I was like, no, no, it, it doesn't. And of course, <laughs> I, I'm not going to stop a recording session and explain the math to you, right. but like, you know, and I, so I do think it is something that not, it is not common knowledge that there is, that there are two E's. Well, in uh, fact, there are four. There are, and I will yeah, right. explain, <laughs> explain that in the book that I, I there are four and you yeah. were making a choice and that's the power of contextualizing these things so that people can actually hear them because you're exactly right. You, mm -hmm. you hold a C and then the E becomes the new idea and we can sing it 14 cents flat or we can sing it eight cents sharp or we can sing it with the vibrato of the piano or there, is, there are even other cultural implications of that particular music. And I know Matthew's music quite well. It's absolutely stunning stuff. And, but you really have to have an instrumental mindset to be mm -hmm. able to get get through that notion, and we don't have key keys to push or or you know um, fingers to move to make those pitch changes. We have to embrace totally the mental concept of that. And so, mm -hmm. what you're suggesting is absolutely so important that something that has been kind of left very ambiguous and kind of you know you all figure that out on your own is because simply there's been no education in it. I and agree. That was the purpose behind the book, essentially. Yeah, I agree. One of the expressions I like to use with choirs when you're in the, one of those moments when the uh, the intonation system that seemed to be working in one part part of a song no longer works based on just which whatever tonal structure has been written or that's right. you know, the composer's idea. One of the expressions I like to use is to tell the choir to take out it just metaphorically in their head take out a new harpsichord. Ooh, you're, like you're just, that. You, you're just going to have to pull out a new harpsichord for that chord and retune it. Think of it in a new way. And it, and I found that even uh, once high school kids are taught that a pitch is not always the same as a pitch, you know, like it, it can change. Uh, then, then that expression even works with kids. That, uh, that's because that's it, such a great concept. I'm so glad you're doing that because it's so right on the money. You know, Scarlatti, 
in his concerts mm. would to retune his harpsichord six, seven, eight times so that the different bean tone tunings he was using or well temperaments would match the way he had, had uh, put the notes together. Mm -hmm. So that should well, tell that, you everything you need to know there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I did, I did my, my master's uh, research and performance practice stuff uh, on, in some Charpentier things. There you go. And, and uh, even uh, during that research process read that there would, it would be quite common practice for a concert to start with multiple harpsichords in the room. Right. Just, you know, if they could afford it, if they could afford right. having multiple instruments that were already there tuned differently uh, and that they would, they would quite literally pull out a new harpsichord. Well, you know, so Quantz, uh, Quantz wrote about, uh, you know, his great book on the art of playing the flute which is where we can study most of how people did embellishments and ornaments. Mm. Mm -hmm. He carried around a bag of lead pipes because the, not only was the tuning system different, but the reference pitch was different. <laughs> so in other words, we have a going as low as in the three hundreds and as high as in the five hundreds. Mm -hmm. And we get upset over four forty to four forty one, but Quance mm -hmm. was carrying a bunch of lead pipes. So he could at least find the key. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, it's it's inter and it's an interesting thing, and I've done a lot of uh, singing of early music too. At, at uh, four fifteen is the most common that I've done. Yep, four fifteen um, or four twelve. Yeah, yeah, and and I actually love it. It's uh, it, it seems to me that like well, in contrary too, we've done quite a bit a bit of four fifteen um, on our our most recent album. There's quite a bit of motets on there that are tuned to four fifteen, and right. I just I don't know why, and you might have a theory. But we had no trouble staying in in tune. It, well, at, first at of all, your tessitura wise, your half step lower, and that always helps. Uh, you think yeah. of the all think of the all of the Louis, excuse me, the Alleluia chorus in D flat rather than D makes a uh -huh. huge vocal difference to your supposed oh, yeah. your tenors. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that uh, D flat is probably the most comfortable human key, just because it hits all the resonances in the right place. And um, you know, Mozart was four twenty two point five. Um, that's still a good clean half step lower than current pitch. Um, yeah. and <clears throat> so, you know, some people make the claim, well, I, I did an AC day conference a few years ago where I started with a Telemann piece. We did it in 415. Second piece we did with Brahms and I did it in 432. And the last piece we did was Ives and I did it with microtonality. Now, how many people in the room were sophisticated enough to hear all that? I, I, it doesn't matter to me. I just found that it made the music more interesting and more timbrely um, on the point. And uh, so I didn't worry too much about whether people got it. I just knew that if I did everything in 440, the Telemann would have sounded uh, lifeless and the Brahms would have sounded under energized and the eyes would have been okay, but we would have missed a whole set of 22 possible pitches that were in the expressive realm. <laughs> so that's my right now. A world yeah. that didn't exist for me 25 years ago, but now that's my world. Right. Uh, and I just now, how much? Glad to share. It. Yeah, it's exciting uh, when you really start to dive into it. And and what I've found is that, like I've hinted at in in our conversation, is that e even young singers can be taught to manipulate to this level of specificity. However, um, there is a certain there's a learning curve of vocal technique that that's has right. to be. That's that has to be at play. And that was the one thing I thought about, like when I was reading through all the math in the book, I think the average choir director would look at your book and say, okay, that's all great, but I can't get my kids to all sing the same note at the same time. So how is this going to help me? Um, and, and so my response to that, I'm so I'm creating a, creating a devil's advocate question and then answering it for my own self is that, that and I'll see how, how you feel about this is that, Knowing all of the theory and the and the concepts behind what we're doing, it isn't a magic pill that's going to teach the kids to sing in tune. No. But if you if you don't have a goal in mind, based on the theory and the science, then you're never going to get there anyway. Well, it makes your analytical tools uh, dull. Um, my analytical tools when I get into a clinic or a, a, a master class are sharp because I I do know what's going on. To a certain extent, I'm always open to, you know, where I still have gaps in my understanding. But generally speaking, let's take a person who can't match pitch as an example. Well, what's the problem? The problem is the environment's too saturated with overtones. And they can't make a choice because their ears are not poor. Their ears are rich. 
They hear all the pitches. They're just not sure which one is the better one to sing. Mm. So when you eliminate the overtones in the environment, they'll start to match pitch. And who do we tend to put them next to? The strongest, biggest singer. Well, that just makes it worse. So put them next to your strongest musician who's got kind of a tiny, breathy voice, and they'll start to match right away. Or sing falsetto or get a recorder. But for goodness sake, don't play the piano and don't use your modal voice you know <laughs> once you do that you're including overtones that they just look at you dizzy because they're hearing so much in their head so i call non-matchers of pitch rainbow ears because they're seeing all the colors they just don't know how to discriminate one color out of the others that's and a really interesting way to look at it i like that all my I college students were had to come by my office who were taking guitar or piano who could match pitch in five minutes they were all matching pitch because yeah. I would start them off with falsetto and then I'd give them the visual cues and then I'd teach them how to audiate that and boom, they were on their way. They all had big gaps in their voice and they're almost all males. But the gap was mm. because the chords were freezing out of confusion. And so it's all solvable. But I, I think you make a very elegant point. I don't think people have to become masterful of the information in the book unless they choose to. And it's a deep dive and it's taken me years to get there. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to workshop. I'm happy to help. I'm happy to make a phone call. I'm happy to write. The thing is, we don't have to do this alone anymore. This is what your service is doing so beautifully. We have things to talk about and we have things we can share. And I don't any longer have to teach in my high school classroom in 1973 all by myself and wonder how I should have really done it because I had no one yeah. to talk to. I Absolutely. have no one to talk to, right? Now we've yeah. got a forum like this where you can talk about it. And now people, you know, I do conferences all the time and I say people email me. You know how many emails I get after a conference? Maybe one or two. And I begin yeah. to wonder, well, what what was the point? You know, the email really is the key or the discussion or the question of your colleague that's teaching, you know, what can I use? Those are the good questions. But they have to be daily. They can't just be once a year when we go to a conference. They they have to be what you're doing now is making daily available discussions to raise questions and then be available to to discuss this and talk about it and back it up. So part of my graduate uh, cohort, the, the kids I've taught over the last 20 years, is to stay in touch and to stay with each other and to help each other through these things that are really complex. They're really hard. But we do, are really, the, yeah. we do it for the benefit of our clients. It's not for my benefit. It's for the benefit of my clients. Nothing mm -hmm. worse than being a front of a conductor that is frustrated because they're not getting what they want because they don't know how to get it. Right. And, and I agree that that is the kind of the, obviously I agree. That's the purpose of this show is one of the other criticisms. It's not really a criticism, just an observation of the, the choral convention presentation model. Right. Is that I think you're right. It's it's so short form, um, and, and it's and it's usually a one way presentation, right. um, and and I think the reason we don't get oh, if you present something and if and if we present something and, and ask and encourage an email afterwards, is that there that that isn't really a good promise of a of a conversation that would actually help the person understand. There you and, go. And so I think so. I think the the podcast is beautiful. Because it's a longer form conversation that could then, if someone felt the need to dive further into the topic like we're doing right now, could then, there's no limit. Like I, I'm allowed to upload, I could, I could make this episode three hours long if I didn't have to start making dinner for my kids soon. There you go. Right? But there, is, <laughs> there, is, there, is no, there is no limit to, to the conversation. And if somebody, if my audience decided, you know, two weeks from now that they wanted to hear more about this topic, I can keep doing more. Right. right. So know, it, it, Rod Eichenberger it, would say to us in our graduate class, he'd say, you know, you go to a con conference and you get super excited about an idea and you bring it back to your choir and you work it over for three days and then you can't make it work anymore. So you let it go. Mm -hmm. And because we never go deep enough into it, we never get beyond the kind of the surface caricature of the idea and we don't get into the character of the idea. So I, I appreciate your approach to this. We're not, we can't explain everything that's in the book, but we can maybe tease people into taking a peek. And, uh, or, you know, start a discussion in their own realm about what intonation really is, and both as a cultural operation and as a cultural opportunity to really explore what somebody else's music is really about when we understand how they're expressing it in right. terms of pitch and timbre. Right. Okay. So I'll, have, I'll finish up with one question then. Sure. Um, 
so that for, since you mentioned teasing people into taking a look at the book, I strongly recommend that people go check this book out. So why don't you first tell us just real simply, how do we find it? Yeah, the book is available on Amazon. Um, I did a self-publication um, so that it could get in print. Uh, so it's available through uh, Amazon.com. And uh, if you want to have something more personal or have me autograph one for you, you can buy it from me. I can actually get get it a little cheaper because I get an author's discount from the books. So you can actually contact me through Pitch Perfect music theory.com all one word all lowercase pitch perfect music theory.com and i will put that link in the show notes as well so that people can see that and and so then uh is the book available only in hard copy only or through amazon can they get the kindle version the kindle version will be back out soon i had some difficulty formatting that but it, it, it i do have that in the works I also have a companion book uh, that's in editing right now and formatting called The Teacher's Companion, which has lesson plans, uh, slideshows, uh, PowerPoint, things that you can do to um, incorporate into your teaching if you choose to teach this. And it's for elementary teachers, high school, te- middle school, high school, um, people teaching music education, people teaching choral methods classes. I've got chapters for all of those people and lesson plans and and uh, lecture topics in that area. It's called The Teacher's Companion. It should be out in three weeks. And then I'm just finishing a third book on incorporating this into the teaching of conducting and podium work in the choral music field. So that's coming out in March. Well, that's awesome and very exciting. And that actually kind of answers the other part of Shannon from my Patreon's question was, that do you have plans to adapt anything for lesson plans and things? And it sounds like obviously you do. That's really exciting. Uh, do you envision uh, at any point will pe- people be able to grab like the book with the lesson plans as a package? Is that- Yes. Yeah. They'll get a severely discounted price for both. Um, awesome. Yeah, that's so perfect. That- so that instead of one hundred and ten dollars, it'll be ninety dollars, and uh, that that way it shows appreciation for the fact that they bought the the, the book and and the companions, which will help explain the book a little bit more. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Donald, I appreciate you coming on the show and talking through this topic, and I'm hoping it helps somebody. And yeah. as you as you mentioned, you're uh, happy to take emails of questions, and I'll put your your contact and website on the show notes, like I mentioned, so people can dive into this as much as they want. Well, thank you. And you're great to talk with. And thank you for not only the great work you're doing in the choral community, but particularly this podcast, which I've enjoyed and and listened to many of your segments. And and, uh, you're bringing great um, questions to the field and providing a forum for us to talk about it. It's greatly appreciated. Awesome. Well, I appreciate the compliment and the kind words and I appreciate your time. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Well, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of an episode. And my goodness, don't you feel smarter for doing so? That just is a, a wealth of information there in Donald Brenniger. And I really appreciate his time. And I hope you got something out of that conversation and learned more. I know what I felt after that conversation was, wow, I, know, I now know so many more things that I can try with my choirs. Because ultimately, that is the point. The, as I mentioned early in the episode to Donald, it's great to know this stuff. It's great to be the bookworm and to be the nerd who knows about choral intonation. It's another thing altogether to take that into your classroom and have it start to change the way your choir sounds. And that ultimately is the goal. But we have to start, as you heard Donald say, training ourselves to understand what's going on, understand why it works when it works, so that we can recreate it and faithfully recreate it. So what a a great, awesome opportunity that we just had to learn from Donald. And that's just a neat and interesting topic. I'm sure there will be more. Uh, As always, it's very helpful if you did get something out of this episode for you to do a few things that can help or pick one of these things. Uh, If you haven't liked or rated the podcast on whatever app you use. If you use the Apple app, for example, or the iTunes app, uh, give it a rating, leave a review. The reviews are really, really important. Those ratings and reviews help the show come up to the top of the list when people search out podcasts on choir stuff. That's very helpful in helping people find the show. 
Another thing you can do that's more obvious, I think, is if you like an episode, go to coralosophy.com under, under the podcast feed, and you can pick out your favorite episodes and share them directly from Facebook there. That's a hugely helpful thing. And then, of course, you can join the Patreon. That's a, uh, an unbelievably helpful thing. Even if, if it's only $3 a month, you might think that's insignificant. But running a podcast like this isn't free. And right now, I'm setting myself at the goal of having that Patreon underwrite the recurring monthly expenses of the show so that the show really starts to pay itself. So that's something that just some huge MVPs over there at Coralosophy on Patreon are essentially the producers of the show. And that's a beautiful thing. And then, of course, hit up those sponsors uh, for some products. They're awesome people, and it also helps the show a lot. So go to ryanmain.com, graphitepublishing.com for your sheet music. Go over to vocevista.com backslash Coralosophy and check out that amazing software. And of course, if you don't already have it, make sure you and your students have memberships for SightReadingFactory.com. At all four of those affiliates, you can use Coralosophy at checkout and knock 10% off the total price. So that's an awesome thing. Well, thank you so much, and we'll be coming at you again soon with another episode. Stay tuned.